Hello, and thank you for joining us. My name is Greg Duque, co-director of the Veterans Advanced Energy Project and a senior fellow at the Atlantic Council Global Energy Center. I will be your moderator. We hope you're able to join us for our opening sessions and are excited to jump into day one of our conference focused on the greedy energy economic recovery. Perhaps you had the opportunity to engage with representatives from Silicon Ranch Corporation and Invenergy over the past hour. We'll be hosting information sessions such as these with other hiring companies over the course of the week. So before we get started, a few housekeeping notes. This event is on the record and we are currently live streaming on Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. We encourage you to post about what you hear today and share on social media using the hashtag Vets Energy Week and by tagging us at AC Global Energy and Vets underscore energy. If you'd like to participate in our conversation today, we encourage you to do so and uh, submit your questions in the Q&A portal located at the bottom of your screen at any time during the event, and we'll incorporate them into our conversation as appropriate. Please note, however, that only those directly engaging via the Veterans Advanced Energy app will be able to submit questions. So let's say let's set the scene and talk about employment opportunities in the energy transition, what's happening out there behind the scenes in the clean energy market for veterans and military spouses in light of the transitioning energy economy, President Biden's executive order on tackling the climate crisis at home and abroad, and new efforts in advanced energy workforce development. We're fortunate today to have four panelists who are deeply experienced experts, steeped in the intersection of veterans, workforce development, and clean energy jobs. James Rodriguez is the U.S. Department of Labor's Acting Assistant Secretary for Veterans Employment and Training, responsible for preparing America's veterans, service members, and their spouses for meaningful careers. James is a Marine Corps veteran. Will Attig leads the Union's Veterans Council, AFL-CIO, representing 1.2 million veteran workers across America with a focus on providing gainful employment for veterans. And the Union Veteran Council mission is to engage, educate, and mobilize the veteran community by giving veterans the tools, platform, and self-empowerment to succeed. Will's an Army veteran. Grant is founder and CFO, excuse me, is uh, co-founder and uh, head of business development of Airstream Renewables, a business that provides career skills training, education, and mentoring for their students, who include veterans and military spouses, to transition into successful renewable energy careers. Catherine McLean is founder and CEO of Dylan Green, a strategic talent acquisition consultancy placing commercial professionals within the clean energy and technology space. So now I'll ask each of our panelists, starting with Catherine, an opportunity to give a short opening statement about how their work relates to employment opportunities in the energy transition. Catherine, over to you. Thanks very much, Greg. Uh, I'll just quickly tell my uh, story about how I got into the clean energy industry because I think that um, it has a lot of parallels to what veterans are going through. I didn't necessarily start off in the clean energy industry. I had a different career path and pivoted into the clean energy industry uh, later in life. Um, I started working at DHL in corporate sales, uh, moved over from Washington, D.C. to London with them, uh, and then sort of fell into uh, recruitment. Uh, when I was working in uh, Robert Half, which is finance and accounting recruitment, um, I then the recession hit and I decided to take a career break and I focused on going back to school and doing my master's in public health. That opportunity wound up being an opportunity to go work at the UN in Rome doing public private partnerships. I realized quite quickly the nonprofit world wasn't necessarily for me, but I had a I had that knack for recruitment, helping a lot of students in the class get opportunities um, in different NGOs. I then decided to go back into recruitment and focus on something that I was um, more passionate about, which was clean energy and sustainability. Um, and have subsequently been in that space for the past decade, setting up a firm in London called McLean Ross um, and selling that firm uh, later to a company called Opus, merging that 
firm <laughs> into a company called JD Ross Energy, uh, and then coming back to the U.S. three years ago to find uh, to start Dylan Green. Uh, Dylan Green focuses on renewable energy, but specifically helping um, diverse candidates uh, within the clean um, energy space and other spaces get into uh, into the field. Thanks, Catherine. Um, Grant, over to you. Hey, good morning. Apologies for the lighting, everybody. I'm at a Marriott hallway, so I just flew into Atlanta to go down to Fort Benning. So uh, Airstreams, we are a uh, vocational training school that trains in six to seven weeks um, veterans to climb cell towers and wind towers and also a ton of solar work. Um, right now, the markets are going crazy, um, but at Airstreams, we have a six-week program that, ha that has uh, six different gates, and they end up getting 10 different certifications, but the key to this is jobs. The job market is going crazy right now, all in uh, all, all over the nation for solar and wind. And, uh, and we just opened up our national training center. We just put $2 million into an old GE building. We built 58 bed spaces. So we bring veterans directly into California. We have a full kitchen there, full laundry rooms, everything there. there. They cut, do three weeks online and they do three weeks um, in person. And then the key is, is most of them walk away with three to five job offers. Veterans are wanted everywhere in these industries. And that's the great thing for vets. Terrific. Thanks, Grant. Will? Oh, thank you so much. And, and I really enjoyed and appreciate the invite to come here to be part of this uh, incredible panel. And like, like Catherine, I'm going to tell my little bit of a story. Um, I'm a combat infantry veteran. Um, I led soldiers uh, from the beginning of the Iraq war through some of the, the worst times. Um, and I think for most of my military career, I thought the worst I was ever going to see was the uh, streets of Ramadi uh, during the surge. But the reality of it, when I came home to Southern Illinois, uh, right after right after the military in 2010, the hardest fight I ever had was was trying to find a job, trying to find my place um, after doing all of that in the military. And I joined the military as a poor kid from Southern Illinois. And I quickly, you know, lost a lot of that dignity and, and self-purpose that I had when I was in the military, when I bounced from, you know, low-end job to low-end job until um, I found a, a veteran training program called Helmets to Hard Hats. And that program uh, put me in a welding booth, um, taught me how to be a basic welder. And then um, that was a direct entry into a United Association Plumbers and Pipefitters Apprenticeship Program. Um, and I went from having the worst moment of worst days of my life being turned down for jobs, uh, being told I wasn't worthy of mid-level management jobs after leading a squad of soldiers in combat, um, to uh, a, a group of people saying, we, we care about you, we support you, um, we're going to make sure you have a future, um, you're going to have a, a decent wage, you're going to have full benefits, um, and, and we're doing this for veterans all over the country. So uh, that day, I, I started to work to make sure other veterans had those same opportunities. Um, and I realized that um, if we can find as many jobs for veterans, um, the more we're going to do for the veterans community. And, and the ironic part of this all is the very first job I ever had was working for a year and a half building a scrubber on one of the worst uh, polluting uh, coal pot fired powerhouses in the Midwest. Um, and that job gave me the stability um, to not only, uh, you know, start to gain money, but have the opportunity to truly transition for the first time and, and breathe and, and, and take assessment of, of what my life is at that moment. And um, I'm just happy here to share uh, how we're going to be able to put a ton more veterans into those some, same opportunities. Terrific. <clears throat> Thanks, Will. Uh, James? Hey, Greg. Thanks again for the opportunity to participate in the panel. Uh, it's good to be up here with Will, Greg, and uh, our grand, I'm sorry, and Catherine. Anytime we get a chance to speak about veteran employment, we always jump at it from a vet's perspective. And uh, it's always good to see uh, leaders like that in these type of emerging markets, as well as their respective organizations who share a commitment to train and place veterans into meaningful careers. I know we're going to have an opportunity to ask questions here later, but I also have uh, some of my staff uh, keeping track of those questions in case I don't get a chance to get to them. But I want to speak a little bit about vets. Uh, our vision is to enable all veterans, transitioning service members, and their spouses to reach their full potential in the workplace. And our mission is to prepare America's veterans, service members, and their spouses for meaningful careers, provide them with employment resources and expertise, protect their employment rights, and promote their employment opportunities. Last year alone, over 2,800 vet staff, contractors, and grantees served over 370,000 veterans 
and military spouses across all agency programs. And each year, nearly 200 service, 200,000 service members take off their uniforms and transition into the civilian workplace. Uh, this is a number we're all too often familiar with, and we still have a lot of work to do when it comes to supporting these 200,000 service members. So we will continue with our priorities of improving the military to civilian transition assistance program and working closely with our strategic partners to include our federal and state governmental organizations and non-governmental organizations, such as unions, training providers, and industry associations. As you all may be familiar with, one of President Biden's priorities in his Build Back Better plan included tackling the climate crisis. And I quote, empowering American workers and businesses to lead a clean energy revolution. So I'm excited for the emerging opportunities for veterans in clean energy. We have a real opportunity to create a clean industry, pathways for veterans and for all Americans, especially those underserved populations by leveraging apprenticeships and other training programs that lead to industry recognized credentials and a great career. These credentials combined with experience in industry also lead to entrepreneurial and business ownership opportunities for veterans. As a matter of fact, on May 21st, the DOL Secretary, Secretary Walsh tweeted, clean energy is the future. By investing in the 21st century jobs and training opportunities, we'll prepare our workforce for a clean energy economy. With that said, I look forward to the panel discussion. And again, happy to be here and join you all. <clears throat> Thank you, James. Let me, uh, let me begin my questions with you, James, and follow sure. up a little bit on something you just addressed, which is President Biden's uh, executive order on tackling the climate crisis at home and abroad, building back better, and ultimately creating good paying clean energy jobs for our veterans and military families. Can, can you give us a view of the clean energy workforce in light of these executive orders and, uh, and uh, executive attention? Sure. Yeah, thanks for that question, Greg. Uh, as you know, the president issued the executive order just one week after he was confirmed, you know, which certainly illustrates that is, this is a big priority for the administration. And given the recent extreme weather events, it certainly should be. I mean, I live in Texas where yesterday was over 100 something degrees, 94 plus percent humidity. And actually that was below average for us for the summer. So we know it's continuously getting hot here in Texas. But if you look all across the country, you see uh, weather and you see climate changes that are uh, consistently getting worse. I mean, the Western US hasn't been this dry for over 400 years. And the nation's largest reservoir, Lake Mead, uh, is two thirds empty. It's the lowest level it's ever been. Uh, when you look at uh, that and you put that in perspective, it tells us we have uh, a crisis on our hands, right? As of last week, firefighters, you know, they were dealing with 85 major fires in an area about the size of Delaware and with months left to go still in the fire season. So let me point out two things within that executive order. Uh, one of them, part one being putting the climate crisis at the center of the United States foreign policy and national security. And then number two, taking a government-wide approach to the climate crisis. When you look at number one, for example, regarding uh, the climate crisis, you know, we take our veterans and we look at how veterans have supported uh, the military instrument of a national power, and they also have the potential to support economic instrument of national power through careers in clean energy that further ensure that the national and economic security of the country through energy independence. Uh, that's something we want to get to as a nation, and I think we continuously worked at that, but we still have a lot of work to do. Uh, tackling the climate crisis is also part of the president's Build Back Better program or plan, as I mentioned, and this includes investments in infrastructure clean energy and expanded training and apprenticeships, something that we at VETS are wholeheartedly committed to. We know that a skilled workforce with a free and fair chance to join a union is foundational to achieving the president's goal of having a 100% carbon-free electricity by 2035. Great. Well, thank you, James. Yeah. Um, well, let me ask you the same question from the union perspective. How is the transition to clean energy going for veterans who are union members? Well, you know, I, I like to think about, I really like to think about things in, in a historical concept. And that's, that was actually what I wanted to do before I decided that I was going to be a union pipe fitter after my, my plans didn't go right. And, and when I take a look back throughout history, um, America has faced changes in their economy, uh, changes in industry, 
um, throughout throughout the entire time of throughout history. And, and every time that happens, uh, America steps up. We do big bold things, um, and and we tackle the future of our country head on. And and that's what I think James was talking about right there. Um, right now, the word I would say how how does uh, the emerging energy market look for 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 unions is opportunity. Um, I don't think it's I think it's perfect yet, but it's an opportunity. There's opportunities that as we move forward, um, that we prioritize workers, we prioritize the communities that have been the most affected by uh, whether it's uh, climate uh, climate change, whether it's uh, socioeconomic issues, underserved communities. Um, if we can together tackle that and say this is the next big part of American history, as as a, as a group and we're going to put veteran workers, those 200,000 workers, uh, to work building our future, just like we did after World War II when it came to infrastructure. Infrastructure was the one thing that happened in America that dramatically turned us into the superpower we are, that made us the country we are. And right now, we realize that we're operating off of infrastructure that's that's old and aging, and it's time to fix that. And and what that means is that we are going to upgrade to the next phase of American history, and that's that's a greener. Um, a, a newer, uh, newer energy economy, but we've got to make sure we understand that the switches just don't turn automatically. We have to make sure that we're paying, att paying attention to the workers that are going to be affected, the communities that are going to be affected by the change in the economy. We've got to make sure that as we transition, we're still investing in the infrastructure we have today, so that it's not uh, being as pollutant. It's not. Uh, it's being more efficient as we transition. So. For me in the union community, it's opportunity, but that opportunity must come with the right regu regulations, the right standards. Um, we can't, we, we gotta make sure that as we transition that again, it's not just you know corporations, CEOs um, that totally get the benefits. We gotta make sure workers are at the table. And um, we see that every day when we're putting veterans together and putting veterans into to, 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 to workforce development programs from pipe fitters to utility workers um, to electricians. Um, and again, each one of those opportunities leads to stability in a veteran's lives and that's, or their family members, so it's so, so important. Great, <clears throat> thank you for that. Uh, Will, uh, just a reminder to our audience out there, throw your questions in as they occur to you and we'll, we'll snag them uh, off and, then, and discuss them. Um, let, me, let me turn uh, to you, Grant. You're deeply experienced in the transformative potential of workforce development uh, in bridging veterans and military spouses to advance energy. How does the SkillBridge program facilitate this transition to clean energy jobs? Uh, as a skill as a SkillBridge member, we uh, we we basically teach on eight different branches nationwide. So from JBLM on the West Coast, include about six bases all through the Midwest and then uh, all the way to Camp Lejeune on the East Coast. So the, what transition members can do is they can actually go permissive TDY while they're in the last 30 days of being in the service. They can go permissive TDY and come take our class, which is a seven week class, where once again, you earn 10 different certifications. Uh, the key is this, the placement side. So um, the Zoom has revolutionized the way we do placement. Um, I just real quick, I was walking by my wife who was teaching 20 kindergartners on Zoom and I said, what is that? And she goes, this is Zoom. And I once again said, what is that? And I instantly light bulb went over my head and I called all 10 of my biggest employers said, would you guys like to meet all of our students on Zoom? And they said, heck yes. So they, uh, so they basically um, get, to, they get to meet at least 20 companies. These aren't small companies. You're talking like GE, Vestas, Nordex, Nextera. Those are the biggest four employers and they beg for veterans. The reason why they're begging for veterans is they want the leadership. They can't find leadership out there. I have two millennial kids. I wouldn't, I wouldn't ask them to lead anything. So it's like, uh, basically, um, they want these leaders. They walk in the door and they go, holy smokes, what did I find? Next Era actually visits every one of our classes and they usually pull between seven and 10 people. Next Era is the biggest company in the world when it comes to renewables, to doing energy. They are the biggest wind and solar company in the world. So um, my son actually got a job there. So I, I'm happy with that. He's not on my payroll anymore. But uh, basically, um, that's it. I mean, we, we train people in seven, six to seven weeks to, uh, and I'll tell you that in the next question, I'll tell you how much people can make. But uh, it's, it's a quick program, no fluff. And we, they earn those certificates. And um, companies are begging to, 
get our employee, begging to get our veterans. He said most walk away with three to five job offers. Grant, let, let me ask you just to follow up briefly on that answer, that excellent answer, and, and give us a, just a little bit broader understanding of the Skillbridge program as it relates to the government, because I think a lot of our audience may not be familiar with it. So Skillbridge, Skillbridge is amazing. So uh, it was like about 10 years ago, um, they realized they had a uh, huge deficit when it came to unemployment. When the military people got out, they were paying so much unemployment. Well, that unemployment comes out with training costs. So what they realized was we need to get these individuals jobs. We need to find and give them the skills that they need to walk out the door with a job. So we're not the only one. There's about 150 skill bridge, and I'm probably on the light side. There's 150 skill bridge companies around the nation that are doing training on every every base if you are a veteran and you're looking for a skill bridge to do training on a base you can go permissive tdy there's barracks space opens up um, of course with COVID, everything closed up for a little while but now it's starting to open again and uh, basically um, you can use a skill bridge now skill bridge has two two different two different capabilities you can do a skill bridge where you can actually do an internship when you're in the last 120 days of a last 120 days, or I think, yeah, last 120 days would be an end. You can go do an internship for four months. So you can pick any company, any company can apply for it. That's not our branch of it. That's not training on a base, but that's that's something open to veterans as well. So if you just Google SkillBridge, very simple. It gives you all the ins and outs of it. Um, if you go on, if you go on Facebook, it's a great way to um, people all the time are saying what's good, what's bad about SkillBridge and how to get involved in it. So I just say, do your research. Um, but if you're a transitioning veteran, no better way is to get an inter to get a job is to get an internship, which basically leads you to your job. Great. Hope that answered it, Greg. Yeah, that's a great answer, Grant. Thank you. I think we have a question from Jerry that uh, Zach is going to answer live. Uh, Zach, I would like to say we have a recruitment session at three thirty on this exact program today. So feel free to join us for that recruitment session to learn more about the Airstream Skillbridge program. Okay, and, and uh, Jerry's question was, uh, he's been out of the service for over 10 years. Can I still apply? I'm unemployed. Can I connect with someone to commence this process? Um, so there you go. You got a session coming up this afternoon, Jerry, to, to address this. And, um, and Greg, just to answer that, there's yeah. two ways. So we utilize the GI Bill, but if they don't have the GI Bill, there's a brand new thing that just got signed, um, which is called VRAP. It's V-R-R-A-P. If you just Google that, it explains the whole program, and it's a way to get veterans back in the workforce. Okay, great. Thank you for that, Grant. Um, we have another interesting question. It's a tough one uh, from Nicholas. Uh, he says, as a U.S. manufacturer of non-glass lightweight solar panels and solar power towers wanting to hire more veterans means we must follow through with banning Chinese solar panels. Will the government enforce this ban so we can hire more veterans? Tough question. Uh, I know no one on this panel is in a position to enforce the ban on uh, tariff ban and so forth with regard to Chinese solar panels. But I, I think I think what it does reinforce is the fact that this is a global energy market, right? And, and what we're doing here at home with regard to producing solar panels and so forth has repercussions across the globe, which is actually what Veterans Advanced Energy Project is about, right? Which is offering a venue for veterans and military spouses to continue to serve after they're out of uniform in terms of energy security and uh, economic security. So um, that's a good question uh, by Nicholas, uh, certainly relevant uh, to what we're discussing today. Um, okay, um, let me let me turn to Catherine. Um, Catherine, D Dylan Green has extensive experience working with startups and corporate businesses operating in clean energy and technology markets globally. Can you tell us how Dylan Green identifies the skill sets, uh, industries such as well, we were just talking about solar, uh, but also wind and hydrogen and microgrid and all the other, you know, nuclear uh, that represent the, uh, uh, the advanced energy economy? And, 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 and further, do veterans and military spouses make for a good fit with these requirements? Well, I think how we identify candidates is very much dependent on you know, the job descriptions and the, what we're asked to, uh, to recruit for. So working on commercial roles, I'm very focused on business development, project development. Um, and, I, and I think in, 
in, in, in other softer skills like sort of marketing positions. I think where I see veterans really um, excelling is on sort of the roles that require engineering capabilities or uh, supply chain understanding, procurement understanding. Um, of course, like uh, Grant was saying around leadership is absolutely vital. Um, it is, you know, just such a, I cannot overemphasize how important it is, um, how so many clients ask me for leadership skills and how when you look at veterans that they have so much of those um, skills, but not only that, trademarks of like integrity, uh, process, procedure, et cetera. So I just wanted to talk about a few statistics that I'm not sure everyone might be aware of, but veterans are 39% more likely to be promoted earlier and 160% more likely to have a graduate degree or higher than non-veterans. Yet one third of veterans remain un under underemployed. Um, 130 plus megawatts of solar power has been installed by the US Navy, Army and Air Force across 31 states. And as the military is, you know, has and continues to be a leader in energy innovation, the clean energy transition and our nation's security are intrinsically linked as countless projects have proven that reducing the military's dependence on fossil fuels directly translates to um, a greater energy security and resiliency. I think the other thing I'll say is that you have to really remember that in clean energy, people are very mission driven. So again, it's so similar in so many ways to, um, the, the, to veterans in the military, just two very sort of mission driven um, individuals and organizations. Catherine, I, I really appreciate that response. And you touched upon something that I'd like to, to go a little bit deeper into, which is veteran underemployment. You know, we, we've all been there and making the transition and we've got, you know, families to feed. We've got, uh, we want to, we, we feel like we want to, you know, continue to work uh, when we're making our transition. Uh, there's a lot of pressure uh, to get moving and that pressure can often lead to underemployment. Uh, and that unemployment can last. H how do you try to find the right fit between not only what the veteran did what they, when they were in uniform, right? Their MOS, but particularly for the younger ones, right? Who may have aspirations well beyond or different from their MOS. How do you find the right fit for them to ensure that this is a profession that they can grow into and not be static? And ultimately underemployed? I think it's a good question. I mean, I, again, I, I probably struggle a bit more than someone like Grant does with placing veterans because I'm on the commercial side. So I think a lot of times there's this generic feeling that veterans, it's like, okay, cool, let's put them in an engineering role or let's put them on um, something technical. But I think that there's a lot of veterans that actually want to do something a bit more commercial, like what we're talking, what I was talking about earlier, project development or business development or um, policy, you know, they may want to do something that doesn't require um, um, their hands, as it were. Um, and I think that I always encourage them in it sort of, when it, it's sort of taking two steps back to take a step forward. I think there has to be an element of being comfortable with being underemployed as long as you back yourself Kind of like what William was saying earlier, like you, you know, you have to maybe sometimes take a couple steps back in order to take um, a step forward. And I think like, but as long as you back yourself and you know that it's a temporary thing and that you're going to go in and you're going to prove yourself and like in the long run, you're going to get to where it is that you aspire to be. I think that's very different than being in something Un, being underemployed for a for a longer period of time because there aren't opportunities. Understand. Does that make sense? Yeah, it, it makes it makes perfect sense. Um, James, let me let me follow up on that with you. Um, is it a mistake for human resource managers, uh, be it big, little, small, public, private, nonprofit, to consider only a veteran's MOS experience when making employment decisions for advanced energy jobs or or should they take a broader view that includes other considerations such as the veterans and, and military spouse untapped skills and job aspirations? Yeah, I gotta tell you, Greg, I believe HR managers, they have to take a broader view to your point uh, than the specific military occupations. And I can tell you uh, from my personal example, if you looked at the 21 years I spent on active duty, 
I had about five MOSs. Out of those five MOFs, MOSs, none of, none of them specifically said I would wind up as the acting assistant secretary of vets. However, right. when you go back and you look below the surface, I did have project management skills, right? And all of the jobs that I had led to project management. And that was actually the first job I had when I retired out of the military, was going to be a project manager. And it fit me well because it, it took all the skill sets that I had developed over a career and put those into practice, but in the defense industry versus the military. And so I think it's important to look at it that way. But also we have to understand, as Catherine was mentioning, look at the interests of the veterans and then look at the underemployment piece of that. So when we look at it from two different scales, the employer uh, perspective, understanding that there is an opportunity for veterans to have a deeper impact in your organization by looking at the potential of that individual when they come into your organization. What can he or she do within your organization to make the organization successful? We know that this, you know, hiring veterans is not only good for a veteran, but it's good for business because it's a good business decision. And things like the apprenticeship programs, as uh, Will had mentioned earlier, we know those are a great, great way and a perfect fit to earn why you learn model that provides a combination of classroom education and on-the-job training that veterans are seeking when they're making that transition out of the military. And so we know apprenticeship programs benefit employees and employers alike as they provide a path to skill trades. Uh, one of the things I want to emphasize real quick is you know, we know college is not for everyone. 60% of transitioning service members leave active duty with just a high school diploma. And for some veterans, a fam like you mentioned, Greg, they have a family support, if you can't afford to go to college, take that much time off. And so we know apprenticeships offer a viable career path, you know, supported by the GI Bill, as Grant mentioned, that lead to well-paying careers. And in fact, the average annual wage of an apprentice once they complete the training program is about $72,000. So when we look at what veterans have to offer in the sense of skills, I mean, it goes without saying there's soft skills, hard skills, but the bottom line is veterans have propensity to learn and succeed given the opportunity. And we want to put them in the right areas where they can succeed and continue to learn. And it's going to be uh, a success for the veteran, but also the business in the end. Hallelujah. Uh, although I got I to gotta disagree with you on one point, James. I suspect that every Marine that ever worked for you figured you'd be Secretary of Labor one day. <laughs> I appreciate that. Thanks. Hey, hey Will, I'm going to throw you a hardball, um, but I think you're up to it. Um, in an 18 July New York Times article titled The Green Economy is a Gig Economy, Norm Schreiber quotes Jim Harrison, the director of renewable energy for the Utility Workers Union of America, in saying, quote, the clean tech industry is incredibly anti-union. It's a lot of transient work, work that is marginal, precarious, and very difficult to be able to organize. Mr. Harrison went on to say in the energy industry, it takes far more people to operate a coal-powered electric plant than it does to operate a wind farm. Many solar farms often make do without a single worker on site. Will, what do you think? Do you agree with that assessment? Well, I, I'd like to first say that, first of all, it shouldn't be uh, the way it is, and it doesn't have to be. Um, I truly believe that if, if we take a holistic view of what advanced energy actually means, um, we can make sure that it works for the entire economy and not just you know, a, a few folks. Um, is it true that there's less jobs for a, a solar panel? Yes. Is it true right now that a lot of the jobs in the in the industry do not pay the same wages as traditional labor labor unions, um, uh, prevailing wage, et cetera? That is very true. Um, I, I, we I have I've had a personal experience with this back in Illinois, where we where I was at, at, interacted with a a solar manuf or in, installation company and. They were looking for veterans to, 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 to be welders uh, for brackets, and they were offering $9.55 um, an hour to, to, to weld brackets together for these panels. And um, I, I told them where to go. Um, what, what, we, what we believe in is, is to, to truly is to be able to give the opportunities um, for our veterans to succeed. And that means good jobs. And that's going to mean our economy succeeds. Um, and right now, I don't believe the way some of the legislation has been written, and I don't believe some of the ways that the that the industry is acting puts the workers and the American, you know, the American economy at the grassroots level first as a priority. 
Um, I, and I believe that if we do that, we're going to have more opportunities to make these great examples of, of how we can succeed. Um, again, I, I think about what Catherine said and what Grant said about SkillBridge. Um, right now, we have uh, dozens of unions that are utilizing SkillBridge to put to train veterans to to learn how to be building trades or be um, other other different industries. Every time we put a veteran through that program, we guarantee them a job all across the country. Um, that job they get sent through a five-year, three-year, four-year apprenticeship program where they, they get multiple certifications, but they also get a guaranteed employment, earn while you learn while you do that. Mm -hmm. And you're not just making 15 bucks an hour, you're making a real livable wage, um, you know, starting off in the 60,000 range, um, moving up. Um, right now in America, 30% of working veterans earn less than $31,000 a year. And I can tell you that when we look at some of our worst places for the statistics we hear about our veterans, it comes from that community. And I know a lot of it comes from the idea of financial instability. If you're making 15 bucks an hour, 300 bucks a week, um, you have a hard time figuring out how you're gonna pay your bills and take care of your family. You know. So what we, we've got to make sure as we evolve as a country, as we move to this next big phase of our country, we don't let people just say, this is how it has to be. We've got to make sure that with this opportunity for change, we actually change the system um, where those workers get put forth. So as of right now, you know, there's an opportunity, but it's going to take all of us coming together to say, you know, just like, just like the, the gentleman said in the question is, you know, this is a holistic thing. It's it's about the plants that manufacture the wind turbines, the, the 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 solar panels. Those are jobs. Those are advanced energy jobs. It may not look like it from the outset, but it is. Um, with, with Skillbridge, you know, we were able to pass a pass a piece of legislation after COVID that that changed the rules. So now Coast Guard members can utilize Skill Skillbridge, and they're going to be able to man the boats um, that are going to utilize and support all of those wind turbines we're going to put outside of uh, the East Coast. That, that's a new economy that doesn't exist right now. But we're going to be able to put U.S. flag ships in the service, hiring U.S. veterans uh, to, to, to create this new grid in the Northeast. And it, it's really exciting to think about. So right now, the way the status quo is, there's some people that are doing really right by their workers in this industry. And we're really proud of it. They're making sure they have the right training. Um, but also, there's also people that are taking advantage of a new opportunity um, to just get everything they can out of the worker and, and put as much into their in, into their into their line. Where we think we need more of it going to the worker um, and and some just transition involved. So be an educated consumer. Got it. Um, hey, um, Grant, let, let let me ask you an associated question with regard to uh, pay and benefits. Uh, in the green energy economy. Um, some of our new green construction jobs, such as building new power lines, may pay well, uh, but many will pay less than traditional energy industry construction jobs in the past. Uh, for example, construction of a new fossil fuel plant in Michigan employs hundreds of skilled tradespeople who typically make at least $60 an hour in wages and benefits. By contrast, about two thirds of the roughly 250 workers employed on a typical utility scale solar project are lower skilled, according to Anthony Prisco, the head of the renewable energy practice for the staffing firm Aerotech. How does Airstream's renew re renewables fit veterans into careers with good pay and benefits? So, so you're absolutely right. So some of the solar industry in the beginning would uh, not pay. Uh, they, would, they wanted you to go $14, $15 an hour, and they want you to go weed eat for eight hours a day to prove yourself, and then they would move you to where you'd be an installer. We don't deal with any of those people. So how we get around that is we deal directly with human resources vice presidents and human resources people that are high up in companies like a GE, a Nordex. We're, we work with vice presidents so if, uh, of, of the company. So they understand what Airstream brings. They understand it's a veteran. They understand it's, an, it's a person that can grow within their company versus someone that's just off the street. So they, real, they see the intangibles, the dedication, the fact that they're gonna complain about the job when it's done as a civilian, we complain about it before, during, and after. So it's just a, it's a different mindset. Uh, they realize, like I said, they realize they're finding leaders. Um, they're finding people. So the average median income, uh, average median for wind turbines is 52,000 a year. 
That's just starting. If you decide you want to travel, you're going to make that 52,000 plus you're going to make 30 to $40,000 per diem tax free on top of that. So um, many of these companies are field cores, the biggest company in the nation right now that tests uh, over 300 people traveling around the nation. Um, it's a division of GE. So great benefits, great travel. Um, a lot of a lot of families will actually put themselves in a tractor in a trailer on a truck and they'll go around. Guess what? After two years, they save eighty thousand dollars and they have a great down payment on a house on a place they decide they want to live while they're out there traveling around the nation. So it's it's a it's a good sustaining job. Solar, um, it's coming up. I mean, the solar industry right now on the residential side, it's offering the most money. It's your home every night, um, most nights, um, and you're making between twenty five and thirty dollars an hour starting. Once you become a lead, you push to thirty five. German electrician pushed to forty to forty five. So it's a very lucrative um, opportunity. But like. Uh, like Catherine said, sometimes you have to take two steps back to take a step forward. We always like to say, you didn't start out as a sergeant when you got in the military, you started as a private. So guess what? You're gonna be a private again for a little while, but guess what? You're gonna go, these companies, all the companies we work with have a plan for veterans to have them progress through their, through their um, companies. So they know they're gonna go tech one, tech two, tech three, and then they're gonna be a site supervisor. And then they're gonna be, um, the, uh, sorry, a lead and then a site supervisor. Well, guess what a site supervisor makes $120,000 a year on a wind farm. We have a lot of guys that have progressed in three to four years to be a site supervisor. So it's, it's, it, the key is, is these industries are growing at such a fast pace. Um, they can't find enough people to do the work. So every veteran's welcome for sure. <clears throat> Thanks, Grant. Jerry Wright signed me up. So I'd welcome more questions and comments from our audience. Uh, we've left some time here in the last uh, 10, 15 minutes to get to them. Um, in the meantime, um, Will, you told me about, um, uh, over the phone, about a Chicagoland program that employs union veterans to upgrade natural gas systems, meters, and valves, highly technical work. Can you tell us more about this program? Yeah, definitely. I think this, this hits on a few things, just the, the, the amazing benefit of veterans to uh, companies that are involved in this, and then also the need to, to understand that you know, we're transitioning, we're not turning switches off uh, to, as, we, as we work to save our environment and our planet. Um, I think it was five years ago, the utility workers in Chicago decided that they were going to, I think it was more, more of eight years ago, I apologize, um, that they were going to create what, was, what they called the Utilities uh, Military Assistance Program. And it's a, it's a skill bridge program, but it's housed at a community college. And what they found themselves with a dramatic need to upgrade and improve uh, the, the grid, the energy grid in, in Chicago, including up, updating valves, meters that leaked um, you know, fossil fuels into the environment. By, by upgrading these, 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 these basic pieces of infrastructure, we're gonna not only, you know, again, to, to help the community, um, help, help the environment also. Uh, since then, uh, two thirds of the new employer, employees at, at, the, at, at the energy company or the uh, utility companies in Chicago are veterans. Um, the program runs cohorts through this uh, small, small college, uh, community college in Chicago, um, where they learn how to be a, a, a entry level uh, gas worker, and they get a direct uh, hire into the uh, into the gas company, People's Gas, which is a great partner. Uh, People's Ca Gas, uh, they, I believe they have an 18 to one return on the investment in the program, showing how much it works. Um, but again, it shows that we can we can employ veterans, we can employ people as we as we do this transition in places that we just that aren't just wind turbines. Or, or just solar panels. And, and when you look at a class, um, I think Mr. Rodriguez has been up to one of those classes. It, it's it's, it's homeless, homeless veterans. It's veterans who were at leaving um, mental health treatment centers. It's um, veterans who've been out of the military and underemployed for 20 years um, that it's going through this project. So it's a really great example of how we can all get band together. And it's a city project. It's a DOL vets project. It's a it's a labor project and it's a private uh, company project and it's putting veterans to work. They're becoming leaders now and it, it's a great example of, of, of a place that we can invest in uh, to support our environment and advance our energy needs. That's a great, great answer, Will. Um, you know, and it's a good segue into, into my next question, which is for all of our panelists, uh, which is, you know, we're all familiar with the social economic ills that have befallen the coal industry uh, workers and their families as uh, coal has been priced out of the uh, economic equation in many regions in the country. 
by natural gas and other advanced energy sources. So, so the, the question for you all is how can the US transition from old energy to advanced energy in a socially and economically responsible way that doesn't leave major segments of our society behind? Anyone want to jump in on that one? Will, I'm going to turn to you first. So okay. I, I, since, I, I, since I know you've got strong opinions on this. I, I've got some strong opinions. And I, I don't think it's just the coal industry. I think you got to look at the communities of most of our fossil fuels, right? Um, most of our fossil fuel industry happens either, you know, around the big refinery operations in, in, in cities, um, usually industrial areas, or in rural America, whether it's coal mines, pipelines, uh, the actual extraction process. So, where we see such a dramatic hit when industry when the industry gets smaller is that it's it's a bigger picture than just what's happening today. Um, there's no other economic base in most of these communities. Um, make, there's not a lot of jobs left in these in these industries, whether it's coal-fired powerhouses, the mining industry. Um, but those jobs are the best-paying jobs in large swaths of our country. Those energy jobs. We were looking at Pennsylvania, West Virginia, Kentucky, Southern Illinois. So when a community that has already lost its manufacturing jobs, it, it, it never, they, those, those, those communities didn't really recover after a recession when it comes to jobs coming back to the area. Um, when we see you know, the, the, the future of an entire industry being wiped out, we see this giant blanket of economic uh, distress happening in these large areas. So to me, if we're not paying attention to that, we're gonna see another, um, Something that just ha that happened to the large cities when textile mills close, or you know, in past generations. So, what we have to pay attention to is if if we're if we're transitioning from that, those coal fire, those coal jobs are the best jobs in community. So, to protect the community, we have to invest in retraining. We have to invest in just transition to make sure that you know the whole community as a whole doesn't take a massive hit. And that's what we're seeing right now. Thanks, Will. Anyone else have any thoughts on that one? Yeah, I was just going to say it's all about retraining. So it's all, I mean, that's what we do. We're in the training business. It's all going to vocational training. Um, not It's for your college, isn't for everybody. Uh, it's really about uh, really about retraining. That's why I really um, like the fact that they uh, they approved the VRRAP fund for veterans, uh, which is which basically gives a veteran a second shot at getting training, getting all of it paid for as well. So you don't have to have the GI Bill, you don't have to have anything, and basically the they'll pay for them to go through retraining, whatever it is. And it's a, it's just a really good opportunity for them to jump in the, into the energy industry um, with some with some training that makes sense for them. Thanks, Grant. James. Yeah, I was going to add uh, to a little bit of context around what we talked about earlier about with the apprenticeship programs and the value that they bring. I think, you know, the concept of uh, earn while you learn is important because you may have, be, have lost some salary now because that industry is gone, but now the process of learning a new skill set, you obviously are, are uh, earning a wage and then that wage gets bumped up once you actually get hired by those companies who understand the value of that individual that they're going to assess while they're in your training programs and then they can put them to work as soon as they finish their training. So I think and not only veterans, but the American economy as a whole can benefit from apprenticeship programs. And we need to continue to emphasize the value that they bring to the workforce of the future. Thank you. Thank you, James. Okay, let me, uh, let me turn to uh, a question about nuclear. We've, said, we've talked a lot about solar. We've talked a lot about wind. And uh, what we haven't talked about yet is, is nuclear. So you know, there are, you know, modular nuclear reactors on, on the forefront, uh, operational energy for DOD, uh, and uh, the debate rages with regard to investing in our nuclear industry. What's, what's the uh, landscape look like for nuclear jobs out there? Any, uh, any thoughts on that one? I mean, having worked in, in Europe for over a decade, Nuclear was um, something I saw up and coming. There were more and more jobs. I think um, after a couple of disasters, it seemed to be um, backpedaling. I've, since I've been back in the U.S. in the past three and a half years, I've not had any nuclear opportunities come my way, and I work on a very wide range of technology opportunities. 
Um, I personally feel like it's a shame. I think there's opportunities to learn from these disasters instead of just knee jerk reactions. But um, I, I don't know what, what Grant's seeing or, or um, other recruiters, but I, I don't get a lot of those. I get none, quite frankly, there's opportunities across my desk. Understand. We're, we're seeing the energy industry, we're seeing a lot more in, in I live in Houston, right? So uh, tons of LNG plants, the LNG plants are going crazy right now. Um, in the down in the down in the area, they're building huge LNG plants. Whether it's for exporting or whether it's for for us here, um, but the LNG plants are going nuts, and these are huge projects. So that's that's in the energy industry. That's where I see a lot of it going. Um, the nuke side, I mean, like like um, like she said, um, I think I think we're a little bit scared of that right now. Um, just, I mean, I'm not, but I mean, it seems like a, a lot of uh, a lot of people are right now in the in the industry. Okay, thank you, Grant. Um, James, you, you uh, have a couple examples of how veterans can leverage their skills to address the labor requirements in the private sector from your acting assistant secretary, Perk Show. Yeah, so a couple of examples. Let me think, there's a ton of them, which are a good one. Uh, I'll give you a quick one. So uh, we had a sergeant, you know, there's always a, uh, some discussions about infantrymen you know, that are not able to transition uh, their military skills from the infantry MOS into the uh, corporate world. Uh, but I'm gonna give you an example on how that can be successful. So I had a Sergeant uh, Army sniper who deployed numerous times, got him a job working at uh, my former company, BAE Systems in the defense and aerospace industry. He was working uh, with some engineers there on some optics. They were building these optics for these um, weapon systems. Uh, it, uh, the sergeant didn't have a college degree, but he had uh, years of experience in the military working with, uh, obviously, optics and weapon systems. Fast forward three years, working in these programs with engineers developing optics, he wound up developing a specific optic system that helped reduce um, the, for night vision goggles and night vision weapon systems, he helped reduce the, uh, trying to explain this correctly, he helped reduce the, uh, the visibility or lack of visibility and uh, within these optic systems. He wound up getting a patent with one of the engineers there. And now he has three patents working on uh, different systems that uh, support uh, optics. So again, when you look at what veterans bring into the um, corporate space, a lot of times it's not only wrapped around uh, their MOS, but it's wrapped around the ability for somebody to pull that uh, those skill sets out of that individual and understand how they can be applied in whatever industry that they are going to go work in, whether it's clean energy or the, whether it's weapon systems, things like that. And I think, again, our, our uh, veterans are resilient. They have the ability to adapt, as we all know, and overcome uh, specific situations. I mean, look at Will. He's a great example of resilience in our veterans. And I think we have to be able to take that as we look at opportunities for uh emerging markets like green energy to find the right locations, the right skill sets, and bringing uh, more veterans into these fields so they understand it more. So it's part of that education that we're talking about, the understanding where the um, industry is going in the future so they can see themselves in this industry for the long term. Well, thank you, James. Yeah. Well, that, that uh, brings us to uh, a close. I'd like to thank our panel for sharing your thoughts and experience with us and our audience uh, for their excellent questions. We've heard that advanced energy is a great opportunity for veterans and military spouses, but like any other structural transition to a fast growing industry, in some cases, policy regulations in the labor market in terms of pay uh, and benefits are still catching up. So I'd like to uh, take a brief moment as well to highlight our upcoming virtual Veterans Advanced Energy Week events that you won't wanna miss. Um, Immediately uh, after our session is an information session with Emerson, a global manufacturing company, uh, as well from 3 to 3.30 Eastern, these are all Eastern times. Uh, bring your energy to Alliance Energy, a Midwest uh, energy company. Meet Alliance recruiters and their veteran resource group, uh, which is essentially the group that uh, will work with you once you're a member of Alliance uh, for your career aspirations. Uh, 3.30 to 4, vocational training for renewable energy jobs, an information session with our own Grant Johnson's Airstreams Renewables, 
and we spoke about that a little bit earlier. And then um, a 4 p.m. keynote conversation with Congresswoman Miller Meeks, uh, moderated by Julia Piper. And this evening, a Veterans Advanced Energy Project event, uh, Veteran Careers in the Renewable Energy Economy with DLA Piper, uh, which is an international law firm uh, with specialties in advanced energy law. So lastly, if any of this interests you, you can apply today for a Veterans Advanced Energy Fellowship, a full year part-time career development program through the Atlantic Council designed to elevate and support veterans interested in the intersection of natural security and clean energy. You can find the application for our fellowship on our webpage. So on behalf of the Veterans Advanced Energy Project and our panel, thank you for joining us today and looking forward to seeing you later in the event. Thanks, Rick.